Hey, hey everyone. My name is Agnes Chen and this is a Rise Resilient podcast where we gather and connect so that all can rise resilient. I'm incredibly excited for today's conversation and I do realize I say this before each and every episode and that's okay because I really mean it, but I'm excited and grateful for today's conversation with Tammy Shamoon who is the co-founder of the Institute of Child Psychology here in Alberta, Canada. Tammy is a registered psychologist and play therapist who along with her partner at the Institute of Child Psychology share their wisdom and passion for empowering parents, teachers, and any professional who works or knows a child to be able to better understand and best support children's mental health through their various online webinars, courses, conferences, and even a child and mental health certification program that they provide through the Institute of Child Psychology. So I first heard Tammy speak two years ago where she shared her wisdom here in Calgary at a conference that a local not-for-profit In From The Cold hosted, where Tammy informed us on childhood trauma with so much compassion while simultaneously connecting us to parts of her own resilient journey, all of which she shares today. The bulk of today's conversation focuses on negativity bias and how and why some brains more readily wire to see and focus on the negative experiences, events, or people in life. In a culture where sometimes I feel that through self-help books, blogs, memes, and even in person, we try to force positive emotions onto others, our kids, friends, perhaps our spouses, I'm guilty of all of it, instead of sitting in the very normal and real feelings that can be anger, jealousy, or sadness amongst others. And although it can definitely feel uncomfortable to sit with another as they feel through those more negative and less positive emotions, sometimes I think we forget, me included, how difficult it can be to see the good in life while in the trenches of a struggle. So in this episode of Rise Resilient, we focus the bulk of the conversation on negativity bias. What is it and how it relates to brain development and how we together can wire a child's brain for positive through positive experiences. Because the goal for me is to ensure that every child is supported in knowing, feeling and seeing the good within themselves so that as adults, they can be the good that is able to see and support the good in others. Uh, all right, so Tammy, okay, so to start, in taking one of your really brilliant courses, so we can chat about that a little bit later, um, but I took this course last year and it was your course specific to trauma. Uh, you had talked briefly about negativity bias in it and specifically stating that Children who are challenged with anxiety encode negative memories and experiences more readily. And you continued in this and you you commented that they tend to focus and find and almost seek out these negative experiences and people and events in life. And I imagine most of us either know children, have children, or maybe we even are that individual that struggles to see the good things in life, especially during the hardships. Um, On the flip side, though, in this particular course, you had also mentioned that we can wire the brain for positive. So I was hoping to focus this conversation on that today, if that's okay. Absolutely. Amazing. So to start, maybe you can define what negativity bias is for us and then explain why some individuals can encode negative memories and experiences or not that they can, but they do encode negative memories and experiences more readily. I think what it comes down to is when we look at the architecture of the brain, you, our brains were developed over the last 2 million years. The one thing it's in charge of, it's number one job that comes before anything else is survival. The brain can do some pretty cool things. Like we can, you know, we made computers that we built the Eiffel Tower. We wrote sonnets. Like the, the brain's amazing, but ultimately it's no use to us if we're dead. <laughs> so just to be very blunt as I usually am. Yeah, like, yeah. And our, so brains essentially are always kind of encoded to be looking for danger anyway. This negativity bias exists in all humans. We encode negative information five times more strongly than positive information. So that, I mean, that goes for, it's not just children who've been traumatized. I mean, that's like an average person, not eat, not including children who have been traumatized. And I think, you know, we're looking at twofold when we're talking about anxiety and trauma, which are often interrelated. 
so the reason for this is our survival. We're meant when something hurts us or scares us or isn't good for us, is toxic for us, our brain says, aha, I need to remember that because I need to avoid that in the future to stay alive. And it, it's not even about situations that threaten our existence, like um, we're looking at like a natural disaster or an illness. This is also relationships that we're, we are designed to remember encounters with people who hurt us because we're, we are designed to live in tribes of people, in communities of people. Our parents must stir, our caregivers must keep us alive. So we know that that relationship is vitally important that for our survival as a species, um, we need to stay connected with the people in our environment. And it, so when something bad happens, there's a rupture in a relationship, uh, we get rejected. Our brain immediately says, I need to remember this because I either need to correct this to stay close to this person because they need to feed me and clothe me and love me and relationships are important, or I could get kicked out of the tribe. So it's not just about our caregivers. It's about like our relationships in our community and our, you know, our extended family, our, <clears throat> our friends who become our extended family, aunts, uncles, whatever that is. And so it's very important because we have to, you know, we can't, we can't grow up in a bubble. We need people, whether that's, um, we need our net, the psychological and physical needs met by other human beings. It's just most mammals are this way. This isn't unique to humans. So we've developed this part of our brain called the amygdala. And I mean, the amygdala is, I, I believe to be the main primary issue with most mental health disorders. I think your amygdala is probably, ironically, is the part of you that keeps you alive. But it is also the part that when it's not working the way it needs to probably hurts you the most. Yeah, actually, can we take a minute and chat about the amygdala? Because the amygdala has such a huge role when we're talking about anxiety and trauma specifically. Can you can you elaborate on what is the amygdala and what is its role? So with kids with trauma, for instance, they have had their amygdala activated over and over and over again. The amygdala is a part of the brain that exists in, in the limbic system. So imagine your brain, it's in the center, right smack dab in the middle of your brain. And, you know, Daniel Siegel, uh, Dr. Tina Bryanson, Bruce per Dr. Bruce Perry, all talk about the, the amygdala in terms of the alarm system of the brain. The amygdala <clears throat> is what's also in charge of our positive emotions. It's not just negative. And it's about attachment and relationship, but also works with your body to be serving our environment for things that aren't safe, that could be a threat to us, whether that's psychologically or physically, emotionally, and whatever you want to call it, it's a threat to our survival. So the amygdala's job is kind of, I know Dr. Tina Bryanson talks about this one time on, um, I was on YouTube, I watched a video, and she said, you know, the amygdala's job is to be a little bit paranoid. The amygdala's job is to survey the environment and say, am I safe? Do I need to go to my caregiver? Do I need my tribe of people? Do I need to hide? Do I need to fight? Do I need to run away? Like, what do I need to do? And if the amygdala learns over time that yes, there is a threat, like something bad happens, whether our feelings are hurt, um, we are physically hurt, some, something goes on, we lose our job. It says, okay, this situation is bad. And so next time when a situation kind of looks like this, we're gonna go on to what's called the fight, <clears throat> sorry, the fight, flight, freeze, collapse response, which basically the emotional brain, the amygdala, it's in charge of the emotional brain, in conjunction with something called the hippocampus, which is all about memories. It's like the memory bank um, in your brain. Those two work together and say, aha, I've been here before. This is not good. I am going to put you into protection mode. So you don't get to think a lot right now. You don't get to make good choices. All you need to do is survive. And then it brings on the calvary, which is the brainstem. And the body goes into what's called fight, flight, freeze, collapse, which is essentially its, its way of um, surviving. It's going to you know, run away from something scary. It's going to freeze to, to survey the scene saying, do, you know, do I need to, to do anything here? It could fight off something. Um, so what it'll do is it'll pump your blood really fast. Your pupils will dilate so you can look for the nearest exit. All your blood pumps into your extremities so you can be faster and stronger. Um, you'll want to go to the bathroom because it's saying, you know, get rid of everything um, we can uh, in our bodies. So this is often when people feel like they have to pee when they're nervous. You know, your palms get sweaty. Um, you get stomach aches or butterflies in your stomach because it stops digesting food. Now, this system works in all mammals. This is just the fight, flight, freeze, collapse response that the amygdala signals to the downstairs brain that we're going to do this. The problem is 
if you've got a kiddo with trauma who has a really or you're a person who has experienced a lot of crappy things in your life that amygdala has been activated over and over and over again so let's just say in a in a in, a, in an average day you're a child who has not experienced trauma maybe it gets activated once a day when you've got a kid who's experienced who has experienced a lot of um, adverse childhood experiences, they've been neglected, abused, that amygdala was activated over and over and over again. So they're more likely to be triggered than, than an average child. That's where that negativity bias comes in several times a day. And if, if you know, it depends on the child, it could be dozens of times a day. It could be all day long for all, all we know. And then we've got toxic stress on the brain. So one of the things with the negativity bias is you know, kids who don't and adults who don't have a chance to process what's happened to them with trauma will stay stuck in their trauma. They, the brain is really good at surviving, but it's really not great about differentiating something that happened in the past from something that's happening now. Um, until you deal with it, what's happened to you, your brain, I mean, if this gets complicated, we, we fragment our memories of what happens. And unfortunately, we can't access our memories in something called a coherent narrative. We're meant to have bad things happen to us. Then we're supposed to relax, have downtime from the crazy things that happen, and then process them and make sense of them and say, like, we tell ourselves, what would I need to learn from this? So, you know, the next time in a romantic relationship, when someone screams at me, this is not a good idea. Okay, so what did I learn? What kind of relationship do I want to attract? What kind of people are good for me? Like you have time to make sense of that information. You talk to somebody. This is how I felt when he did that. This was my thoughts about this. Um, you have a good cry with a friend. Like you have time to like go through that narrative of what happened. If you've got trauma, you don't have, you know, and especially if the environment is consistently uh, traumatizing over and over and over again. Um, your brain kind of checks out from the experience that has happened and your, your memories, it's almost like a, um, like a piece of glass. It fragments into like a thousand little pieces and you don't have a chance to put those pieces back together and say, what happened to me? Like, why did that happen? What do I need to learn from this? It's in the past. It's not happening now. So your brains really need to review this information. If you don't do this review of information, um, then you're going to get kind of stuck in this negativity bias because certain things, your brain is constantly going to be surveying the scene for memories that look similar to the bad thing that happened, essentially. This is how, what I say to kids, the bad thing that happened. So it's a little more neutral. And unfortunately, until that information is processed and we, our brains can make sense of what happened to us, we're constantly looking for information to confirm what we believe to be true about our worlds. All people hate me. I'm no good. I'm bad. My parents can't protect me, whatever that is. And un unfortunately, there is an array of ammo in the world that can confirm any negative belief. Just turn on social media for five minutes. Like there's always going to be things that can confirm a crappy worldview. Is, is that, is that makes does that resonate oh, a little bit? Definitely. Yeah. I think you just touched on so many, um, so many places. And I think it's also validating that this is a normal part of development and it just goes into overdrive when someone has experienced trauma. So yeah, Ooh. definitely. One quick thing that, that amygdala we talked about, imagine that as a muscle. And if that amygdala has been used over and over again, that muscle's pretty strong. So that's the other thing too. You got to remember if it's been activated over and over and over again, that's just like anything. If you just do leg day at the gym over and over and over again, you're going to have really strong <laughs> So the amygdala, if, with kids with trauma, just gets turned on really easily because that muscle is so well worked. So that's the other piece. I just want to talk about like brain architecture too. It's just, it's just, it's easily accessed because those neural, those uh, neural connections, that pathway is well walked. If we think mm -hmm. of it. Yeah. So then on that note, you know, knowing all of this and knowing that there are, there are uh, kids in our communities who do live in chaotic environments and will likely have this overactive amygdala. So how can we, um, one, if you're an adult and you've never had that opportunity to work through that process, you know, how can you overcome negativity bias? And on, on the flip side, how can you support children to overcome that negativity bias? You know, and I'm going to be completely biased because I'm a therapist, right? Yes. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't mean, you don't have to see a therapist, but I think you got to talk to someone. Totally. Like, yeah. You really. I mean, children, young kids don't need to necessarily talk. They need to play it out. I mean, this is why I, I, I work in ch with children with play therapy and art therapy and animal assisted therapy. Uh, young kids, it's a lot easier to heal trauma than adults. 
but I mean, you've got to tell your story somehow. And even if it's not into a person, can you journal that story? Um, can you create something to, that represents that experience? Um, to allow your brain, it's called desensitization. So this is what your brain needs to do. It needs to review the information and realize it's not happening in the present moment. It's something that happened before. And then we have to, as an adult, say, you know, what, what were my thoughts about that? And how have those thoughts now, how are those, like, whatever that was, like, um, I'm never protected, for instance, or I'm bad. How have those words now rung true to me as an adult? And so when, when, and when I get triggered by those thoughts today, I am bad or um, I'm no good or no one loves me, realize that it's old stuff coming up. So we have to be able to say, like, is this really about this moment or is this my stuff from from before coming up for me that's now, I'm, it's all intertwined. And I mean, we all do that to an extent, but with trauma, it's really specific, you know, it's really important that we we review that information and we find some way to, to process that. And it's, of course, as I deal with a therapist trained in trauma, that you would do something like this with, for instance, somatic experiencing is one type of therapy, uh, EMDR, eye movement desensitization reprocessing therapy, that's a mouthful. And for kids, you know, this is where when, when, when bad things happen or chaotic things happen or they feel rejected, I always recommend that the parents take the time to really review that information with their child at the end of the day. And even if it's something we think is pretty benign, but it was, it was impactful and they felt um, very threatened, whether that's, you know, physically or emotionally. And I always tell them, you know, you know, always go through what were some thoughts or what did you think about that? How did you feel about that? And where did that feeling hide in your body? Because that's really important. We have to get all our thinking brain on, our emotional brain on, as well as the, the, our, our bo- the sensation in our body. Because we're accessing then the information at the three different levels of the brain. The upstairs brain, the, um, the, the cortical brain, that's the thinking brain. The limbic system, that's the, the feeling. And then what happens is the emotions hide in our body, which is your brain stem, your lower, the very lower part of the brain. So that's important that we review. And so kids are great at storytelling. So, I mean, it's really easy to do this work with kids to review the story of what happened, but make sure that we tap into those three, three things. What are the words? What are the feelings? And um, where do those feelings hide in our bodies? And then, or where do they feel it in their body? The Mm -hmm. other thing is you've got a negativity bias. You know, it's five to one, right? Five, it's five times more potent. That means we have to draw attention to positives that much more often in kids. Some some recent research that I, I think I've been even quoting it wrong over the last six years was you know, there is a five to one ratio in in, uh, in couples therapy that the, the, the Gottman Institute talks about that for every five, for, for marriages to stay healthy, it's five positives for every one negative. And it turns out that's only during conflict so it means that during conflict, when you're when you're going at it with your spouse, there has to be five positives to every one negative that go on. Turns out, in to, to develop a healthy relationship with someone, you need twenty positives for every one negative to have oh healthy attachment. And I was like, oh my gosh, I've been doing this long for. And I, it was because I, I listened to Dr. Gottman uh, being interviewed on a podcast recently about the there was a misconception about his research on the five to one. So mm, what if wow. we, uh, yeah, yeah. So no, not wow for you, for you. I, I, that happens, but I even just that idea of 20 to one that for, po- I, for, for interacting yeah. with your children on an ever, and they're not big things. It's not like you have to go, you know, buy your kid a trip to Disneyland every day. Mm-hmm. It just, it's as simple as like eye contact and your hand on their shoulder and just a smile, a nod, a recognition, like whatever that is, just little tiny, tiny bits for connection that we, their kids need. And mm. the research supports that one of the best ways to um, to guard against negativity bias is gratitude. So gratitude and pointing our attention, and ju- you can journal it, you can cite it. Um, I, I do this with my kids several times a day, like constantly pointing their attention towards like the good things in their life and the things we're grateful for and the things that we have that other people maybe don't have that we wish they had for other kids in the world. Um, mm. Just, just noticing and pointing their attention when their sibling does something for them. So lots of pointing out to, to the good and how they over overcame something and what lesson did they learn from that scary thing. So we can always take an adverse experience and say, what did we learn from this? That was scary, but what, what, can, what did we learn? Oh, next time I, don't, I can't climb so high. That can be really, yeah, because we can fall and hurt ourselves. But wow, you know that now. You know you can only climb this high 
right now. And now you know what your body can do. So it's, it's, it's a constantly reframing information for kids. Mm, it's amazing. Theory. So, yeah, I, you know, I was going to ask, you know, how can we hardwire our children's brain for positive experiences? But I think you just touched on all of that, connecting with them throughout the day, pointing out the things that we're grateful for, pointing out the things they've learned and overcome. Well, like even with when we look at that, like natural disasters or something, and people say, how, how can you possibly find out, like point out something good about thousands of people dying? And I said, you know, what I tell in, in that case is, you know, there's a tsunami or something. I say, look for the helpers. Like look mm. for all the good, like that people are volunteering, people are coming into the world and, and helping these people and donating money or whatever that is that they're, you know, flying over there and there's rescue crews, like it, it points to the, the inherent good in people. Mm-hmm. And that isn't that an opportunity to see how people are inherently good and want to help and are altruistic by nature if given the opportunity? There, it, there is always, you can always learn something, I don't, you know, from something. And maybe not in the moment when it's that a bad thing's happening to you, but, you know, once you've had some distance away from it. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. No, I love that. I think that that's really beautiful and 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 very relevant to today with COVID. <laughs> right. And so I think one of the biggest things with COVID that, uh, you know, that I've talked to families about and I've even considered myself was this wake up call for society to slow down and, and how important connection is and that we take certain people for granted, like first line workers, you know, the frontline workers uh, that we you know, people who work in grocery stores, like being, having gratitude for, for these kinds of things. Um, mm-hmm. So as much as it's horrible, um, I, I think you can find good in pretty much anything or at least a lesson that, that needs to be taught. And mm-hmm. we can start children very young at that reframe. We can't bubble wrap our kids from bad things happening. We'd love to, but we can't. But resilience doesn't come from bubble wrapping kids. <laughs> That's right. Right. Really exactly. comes from children being knocked down and being hurt and, and sitting, moving towards their pain, processing their pain and saying, I can now learn from my pain and I'm gonna do better next time. That's resilience, see, that's grit. All right, so understanding and having chatted about negativity bias now, I have a question for you. And it's regarding a key message we hear a lot in society and that being, you know, to choose happiness, choose joy, or choose gratitude. And often I find, you know, it's likely unintentional, but we tell people to choose another emotion, such as happiness, instead of these so-called negative emotions. And, you know, I mean, I've done it to my kids. Um, I've had it done to me as well. You know, what are your thoughts about this, about being able to choose joy, or, you know, about these messages that we are hearing in society? I was literally listening to a podcast this morning <laughs> on the way to work <laughs> and, and, you know, I'd have to actually look up who it was. It was a monk, I believe it, a monk from India was, was talking yeah. about um, kind of the purpose of life and his views of over the last 40 years of being a monk. And he really talked about like, even when the world is very, you're in a dark place. Um, when you are depressed or all you can see are the negative things happening one of the easiest ways to come out of that is to help someone else is to provide assistance to someone who is also struggling and that doesn't mean fiscally like it doesn't mean money it can be anything i get you know for kids it could be a younger sibling a pet a neighbor and that when we provide assistance and service to other people we get a great big shot of dopamine and serotonin which are going to help you regulate and oxytocin too so like all these really feel good neurotransmitters that are going to mitigate a lot of negative mental health um, outcomes mm-hmm. are, are going to, so I, I really think, yes, it can be very difficult to, to choose joy in that moment because I, I think this, and this is my opinion. I think maybe that people assume that depression and anxiety and grief are bad and that we need to run towards the positive emotions. And I, I think that might be a bit of a mistake and a misunderstanding of our emotional systems we are meant to experience all of our emotions. And, you know, I think one of the beautiful things about being human is we do get to experience joy, but I, I don't think you can ever choose joy in every moment, but I, I think you will, it'll be easier to cultivate joy if you give space for the other emotions too. But you mm-hmm. have to give it. I think the more, the more space you give it, the less it takes. 
So it's okay to be in your grief and in your depression and in your anxiety. We don't want to wallow in it forever, but if you try to avoid it all the time, like it, it's going to stay there. It, it needs to breathe. Um, it needs to be named. It needs to be, be honored. And I think that's one of the, the, it becomes very Mary Poppins just being like, Oh, you know, just think happy thoughts when you're sad. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, you're sad. Like that's your, you're meant to feel that for a reason. Mother nature designed that or God, whatever you want to call it, designed these emotions for a very good reason. And we're supposed to pay attention to them. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's one of the things that we sometimes take messages to, to the extreme that, yeah, joy, get rid of, not, you know, I don't think you can ever get rid of all the toxic people in your life without hurting. Yeah. And, and what we know about research about toxic people is cutting everybody out of your life is just as unhealthy as keeping every toxic person in your life. That mm. cut emotional cutoffs, there's no research to support that's healthy. That, yes, of course, we want to be careful about who's in our tribe, but there are times we can't do that and shouldn't do that because these people have lessons to teach us. And it doesn't mean we, we, we let them in and tell our stories to them, but I think there comes empathy and tolerance come from dealing with people like that if we can still you know maintain emotion regulation so I guess that's a really long-winded way of saying I don't think you do get to just choose joy no no I think that that is amazing thank you um you know I brought it up because I think that there's sometimes we push these ideas of you know being positive and replace these negative feelings with with positive emotions but kind of when you're in the trenches of struggle or when you've experienced trauma that keeps sort of resurfacing it it can feel very invalidating to have someone um, ask you to be you know to choose joy or choose gratitude instead of that negative emotion so thank you I appreciate you you chatting about that but on that note you know you are the co-founder of the Institute of Child Psychology you know you've made learning about how to best raise teach and support children and their mental wellness really accessible to parents and health professionals and really anyone who has or knows a kid um, through your webinars you have courses there's a certification program so where does the heart of all your determination and passion come from tammy well i think first and foremost um if we start the journey from the beginning in a very short way i was a child who suffered with a lot of mental health issues I had a lot of trauma in my history so of course a lot of us who end up going through that kind of fire want to help people also through that fire and show them there is a way through um and sometimes the best helpers are those who have been through the worst circumstances and and I don't want to say like I you know I didn't uh, grow up in a war-torn country or anything but um my family waged its own wars that took a really big toll on my mental health growing up um, as a kiddo and it came down to, I was hospitalized for suicide as a teenager. Um, I had some addiction issues earlier on in my college years. There was, there was a lot going on for me. Um, and then depression and anxiety and anxiety disorder. And so, you know, after years of therapy, I ended up becoming a therapist. Um, and then I was actually studying to be a couples therapist and I hated it. And I, <sighs> I was a teacher before I became a psychologist and I realized I, I had a knack for working with kids. So I eventually moved my practice into working with, with children and then, you know, established a private practice and it was a group practice and et cetera, et cetera. I became very frustrated um, with the inability to help the amount of people out there that I would like to you know, I was in my community and I felt like I was making an impact, but not on the scale that I wanted to make an impact. And in some people that's okay. But to me, there were so many issues in mental health globally that I said, like, there's got to be a better way. Yeah. Wow. Um, I just, I first want to say thank you for sharing that with us. You know, um, it's, it's so true. I can, I can definitely relate to that, you know, knowing you've been through the fire, you want to help other people get out. And um, I just think it's so incredible that you are using your resilience to, do so much and create so much change so thank you um you know on that note so this so now you have this practice and can you tell us a little bit about it are you still doing you know practicing privately and chat a little bit about you know the courses that you have and that you put so much into yeah so now you know i still have my private practice here i'm not actually practicing right now um but so that hasn't gone away. I still feel like I'm giving back to my community. But now we, my business partner, Tanya and I decided um, that we wanted to make, like I said, more of an impact 
with with children's mental health kind of on the in that global sense and I feel there are very few people trained in working with children even mental health therapists and psychologists and social workers it's a lot of the work's inappropriate and um, doesn't mean they're not great psychologists for teenagers even or adults or couples or families but working with kids is is a is a pretty specific uh, specialization and it requires a lot of training and a lot of people even who are helpers nurses social workers psychologists they either don't know they should probably get this training or they can't afford it or you know it's they're in a remote place um, where they can't get that kind of training whatever that is so we wanted to be able to provide trainings for not only professionals and also caregivers so it was meant to be accessible at, at different levels So Tammy, thank you so much. I don't know if there's anything else that you wanted to add, but I just think, yeah, I, I really appreciate everything you're doing and for taking the time today. Yeah, no, I, I really, thanks for the opportunity to your, to your viewers, your listeners here. Um, we actually just released a free, po- I think you knew that. I think yes. You <laughs> no, thank you. Actually, thank you. Talk about this. Trauma a webinar, a one hour, um, if, of course, at the end, we do say, if you do want to purchase the full course, you can. But uh, it, it was, we, we just have, we we're trying to do as many of these as possible, like free free things if we can and handouts and things like that for, for people. And what's really cool about that one is we collaborated with Dr. Bruce Perry. And in the handout that we actually give, he contributed, I think, eight or nine pages at the end of it of his, his free handout. So we actually joined them together with his Amazing. Child Trauma Network. Amazing. Yeah. So he was really pivotal in developing that handout. And then he then agreed to do our keynote for our spring conference. So wow. it, it, it was a really like, yeah, for me, I was really starstruck. Totally. That handout is really a collaboration between his, his network down in the U.S. and our institute here in Canada. So amazing amazing and on that note you do have your your mental health conferences are also just as great as all the courses that you have so um, we We went online mm -hmm. and begrudgingly just like everybody yeah and um the global response was so like big for us that we've decided now that's actually we might do some smaller conferences in, in alberta like it's our it's our province and we will continue to do live trainings here but um we realized that it was needed at at an entirely different level than we thought and so we will do one every fall and every spring now yeah amazing conference amazing oh tammy i'm just so grateful that you uh you could share all of this with us and i'm super excited just to to follow honestly it's been really yeah, you've been, I think, just such a pillar in, in our community here in Alberta and Calgary and Edmonton. So, um, yeah, so thank you for taking the time today. Oh, of course. And I'm glad we finally were able to do that in Oregon. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs>